Rob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, issues of academic integrity on college campuses has grown post-COVID, but many view the advent of artificial intelligent apps as an irresistible license to cheat in the classroom, and of course, a new threat to academic integrity. We're joining me in a conversation on the challenges of AI and academic integrity are Dr. Kara Latoposki, Director of Academic Integrity at Virginia Tech, and Dr. Laura McLeary, Provost at Hollins University, and thank you each for joining us. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having us. Well, let me see. It seems like pre-COVID, a decade prior to that or what have you, and as an administrator myself, I had seen that instances of challenges to cheating, academic integrity, decade long had increased. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, preparing my conversation, it said it seems like post-COVID, it has increased. Is that your experience that you're uh, finding? Is that true? Well, at our institution, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the case, um, but perhaps the ways that students are trying to get around assignments might be different than they used to be. Um, I think that there's always been um, sort of that perhaps a tendency maybe because of the way that we structure our classrooms that students might feel pressured into choosing ways of completing assignments that we might not consider to be optimal. Um, so, I would say that we've seen a noticeable increase in academic dishonesty at Virginia Tech um, post-COVID. This is really due to the increase of um, available resources for students related to things like ChatGPT and other forms of generative artificial intelligence, Chag, as well as other different online repositories that students are becoming more and more aware of. You know, and faculty are also becoming more and more aware of these resources that students are using. So it's easier, it's becoming easier for faculty to identify problems that existed in the past and are continuing to increase in the future. Well, and, and is it taking a little bit of a uh, step back though, is there, I mean, are the lines getting blurred between what we know is right, what we should and should not do? Um, is that part of the culture that we are in now? Well, I, I, I wonder if we could kind of move it in a direction of thinking about how do we engage with students on uses of technologies mm -hmm. that um, we know that they're using in a way that can be productive and supportive of the work that they're doing. So I think um, rather than thinking about how are we going to prevent cheating, it's more along the lines of how are we going to create classroom environments where students don't feel motivated to cheat. Now, that's not to say that we can eliminate all mm -hmm. forms of cheating, but I think if we're more, and I think, Carrie, you and I had just a brief mm -hmm. conversation yes. beforehand about being proactive about creating classroom environments, creating assignments. Um, I don't like to use the word necessarily cheat proof, but to have a, a conversation with students about, you know, I think higher education in my mind is about teaching students not only about knowledge, but about dispositions. So that means how to be a human being in the world. And so to have a conversation with students about the ethical uses of AI, I think is just critically important. And I think that that's something um, that we need to be building into the learning environment is thinking metacognitively with students about how do I use this? When is it effective? When is it not? What are the limitations? What are the uses? Yeah, so kind of going to your question, you know, I think that for some students, they feel the lines are blurred. Uh, you know, things that were fine during COVID are no longer fine now that we're all back in person. So for example, a faculty member might assign a student an exam to take home and to use their resources were um, when we were doing at-home learning, uh, when we were doing online courses more regularly. And now that we're back in the classroom, um, I see students really struggling to understand that sometimes they need to go to class to take the exam because before, before it was fine to do it in their homes and that's the culture that many of our students are coming to college with coming from high school because they're this COVID generation um, where they've gotten used to a certain set of expectations and now they're different post COVID. So I think it's a societal issue that we're, we're really looking at and in, in how um, we approach what is the truth, what is integrity, um, and how we're teaching students about that. And I think that's something we really should be focusing on um, at our universities. I think that's so incredibly critical for the success of our students and to really combat issues related to academic dishonesty in the classroom. Well, you know, in some ways, it's kind of, things always change, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit older, and so, um, you know, a slide rule, finally could have a calculator. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Um, there was no internet, there was no Wikipedia. For me, it was a library. And I exactly. spent the whole time right. there in the library um, and not having easy access. Uh, but this is another kind of in that, that each of those various technologies mm -hmm. were adapted to. And I think that's kind of what you were getting at, that okay. it is here. That's right. And then we need to right. I think the, the adaptability. I think be having curiosity about it. I mean, I think we don't we don't know everything yet about what this technology mm -hmm. can do. So um, being curious, being open, um, providing opportunities to play with AI. You know, rather than making it something that we've forbidding. And I think oftentimes when we forbid things, that's when they become <laughs> much more attractive. So agree, yes. how do we make spaces in the classroom to say, well, what would happen if we use this technology to? Uh, respond to some big questions that we're grappling with in the classroom and then use that opportunity to say well is it actually getting at the things that we think are um, important for this discipline or are is it doing is it going off into a different direction we need to anticipate or when do we see instances of how bias creeps into its responses too so using those good critical analytical skills that were some I think are afraid that we're going to lose by using AI rather how do we engage with those mm -hmm critical analytical skills to question the responses of the, of the um, artificial intelligence. You know, I believe we have a real opportunity to teach students to use artificial intelligence ethically mm -hmm. in the classroom. If we don't do that here at Virginia Tech, at Hollins University, at other universities and other institutions across the country, when they go into the industry in the real world, when there's an expectation at some point that they engage with something um, that's built on generative AI or another language learning model, um, when are they going to learn that? Mm -hmm. We have an opportunity now to get ahead of it, to really teach our students to be responsible users and I think that's what we should be focusing on rather than saying, no, don't, um, because the reality is it's here. Right. It's not going away. It's only going to improve if we don't start to work with it and start to address issues related to ethics with AI. Mm -hmm. We're going to miss the boat, and that's going to be a bigger problem. Well, what about AI that is most challenging as it relates to mm -hmm. integrity? What, mm -hmm. what about that technology, is it because it's too easy, quote, to abuse, or it can um, impact what critical thinking, practice, I mean, in other words, what, what makes mm -hmm. AI a threat to academic integrity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at its core? Well, I don't, I guess I, I might phrase that a little bit differently. I don't know that it needs to be a threat. So I think in, not engaging with it and not querying its usages, I think that's the threat, right? Not being engaged. Um, because I think when you start to have that conversation with students, involve them in the decision making about how might we use this technology in our classes and come up with parameters, I can almost guarantee you that students are gonna have their own qualms about it as well and that they will help to kind of self-monitor one another. You know, what are good uses? What are not good uses? What are ethical uses? What are, what are non-ethical uses for it? So again, I think I would come back to that piece that is so critical and making sure that students are engaged in that conversation with their faculty mm -hmm. about how, how to use the technology so we don't get to that point about the, it be feeling like it's a threat to, to learning. Yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a threat to learning. Uh, you know, I agree. You know, I think, the, I think one of the problems with students using it in the classroom is that if they are um, not using it appropriately and they're not doing the work themselves, they're not learning the theoretical framework behind the work that they'll, that they'll need to know to, when they're out in industry or when they're moving on to graduate school or whatever they're doing with their lives as they're moving forward. You know, one of the larger issues with AI, with the, with the current, with ChatGPT and other forms of generative AI is that it's not accurate. Mm -hmm. We know that it generates things that didn't really happen mm -hmm. and claims them as fact. There, there was a great story, I believe, in the Washington Post about an attorney who was suing an airline and he used ChatGPT to generate all of um, his sources and case citations, use it to write a brief, to send to the judge, beautifully written. None of the things that it cited were at, were ever happened <laughs> or were true. Well, I think, I think the main point is really getting um, students to the point or anybody who's using AI to understand that they're responsible for the output Absolutely. and they're responsible for monitoring that output. They're also responsible for the prompts they create. And I think like any tool, there are 
developing good practices mm -hmm. for how to engage with AI, so how to develop good prompts. So um, you know, you might want to get your students to be thinking about not just here's a here's a, a prompt, write my paper for me, but rather ask me questions. So there's mm -hmm. there's another way to get the AI to help you to do and in, to interrogate your own thinking rather than having it do do the thinking right. for you. Well, and really recognizing that it's a tool. Right. You are the person, it is a tool that it may or may not assist you, but it's your job to do the critical thinking piece right. and to make sure that you're learning and growing. Mm -hmm. Your chat GPT, generative AI should not be doing the work for you. It is a tool. That's right. Well, so, um, and maybe I was in administration too long, academic, but um, what is, as an institution, I mean, mm -hmm. there's got to be some general policies, right? Sure. So going forward, before we talk about uh, uh, faculty per se and, and some things there, are you going to develop kind of broad outlines or policy kind mm -hmm. of framework or best sure. practices? related yeah. to yeah you know I believe best practices of course for faculty are always fantastic you know I know at Virginia Tech that they are we are very concerned about making sure that we provide information to our faculty about interacting with generative AI mm -hmm. in the best way we possibly can from a faculty perspective that way we can really improve learning in the classroom you know we believe that our academic integrity policies fully cover anything mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. related to generative artificial intelligence or other other things that students might do because frankly, as I mentioned, generative AI is a tool. It's a, it, it, it may be an unauthorized resource which falls under um, our cheating policy or our policy related mm -hmm. to violation of the rules. Right, I would say it's pretty similar at Hollins and we've been working with our digital pedagogy specialist mm -hmm. on developing some resources for faculty um, and then also um, a citation. Mm -hmm. How do you cite the use of, of yes. ChatGPT in your work? So, um, and then we, you know, we, again, like Kara said, it kind of, for us it also falls under other academic integrity policies. So if you use it without citation, then it is a form of plagiarism or, you know, um, you know, a violation of academic integrity. So it does, in a sense, fall under existing policy. Well, I can recall well uh, me going to some faculty development to even first time putting together a PowerPoint. Uh, how, do, how do you teach online what are the best practices? Mm -hmm. And so it seems that um, that will require some faculty development or, or, sure. or practicing or learning mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. using it. Yes, indeed. Um, so when you say that right now the policies pretty much, this is just an example of using that, but I could see where it could be lack of consistency and it might make it confusing yes. across faculty in some of the classes. That would be my, mm -hmm. it may be fine for us to, okay, let's ask it a question and we identify some of the factors of this or, or that as a class exercise or maybe to help me get started or what mm -hmm. have you. But I guess faculty are going to have to be fairly prescriptive on the syllabus yes. about the use and what yes. is acceptable or not. That's correct, yes. Well, and I think you're getting at exactly, you know, so I think some of the things that we're trying to deal with right now, too, is allow enough autonomy among our faculty to make decisions about how they'd like to use it and whether it's appropriate in their classes. But most of all, make sure that they're communicating that clearly mm -hmm. to their students, what if they have individual policies in their classes as to what that is. You know, and I think, again, as we, we've already been discussing, just that ongoing need for the opportunity to learn about the professional development, um, again, I think these are just really early days in thinking about how, um, you know, how institutionally, if there is a particular approach we want to take. I'm not sure that there is just one approach. I, I think there's probably going to be multiple approaches, but I think the clarity around um, what, what those approaches are the most important. Absolutely. You know, just like with all of our faculty, everyone's different, I think, in their comfort level with, with using um, generative artificial intelligence. And I think we have to respect that and recognize everyone's in a different place and wants to conduct their classroom differently. That's a wonderful thing about academic freedom that we have um, to make sure that we're managing our classrooms the way that we want to. With um, syllabuses, you know, I, it's my belief and, and the way that we are at Virginia Tech, you know, if you don't specifically say that this is a resource you can use and you've mm -hmm. said, you know, other outside resource resources are allowed, ChatGPT falls within that. You know, 
it is, I, I believe it's impossible to list out everything a student can or can't do. And I think it's you know, unreasonable to expect a faculty member to do that. So we look at it more so from the perspective of what were the, what were the rules that you set for the exam? And does the behavior fall within those rules? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, prior to retirement, um, what used to be a two-page syllabus now is 12 pages. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> Everything that you can't, and just to protect themselves Absolutely. in terms of going through the process. And so you don't want it necessarily to be a burden. Do you think that it would differ across disciplines? It seems to me that some disciplines would lend themselves um, to using it perhaps more, perhaps even more creative, and would blur some of the um, rules, I guess you mm -hmm. might say. Not rules, but in terms of, of fairness and proper usage. I don't know. Well, I, I think every discipline, I think, could gain something from um, an engagement and understanding. You know, again, just starting to understand, let's say, for example, you were teaching um, an English course, or let's say you were teaching a math course, experimenting with, you know, what would happen if I put a prompt um, that I gave to my students for a homework assignment into ChatGPT, again, and just kind of experiment with what, what might be possible, and, and learning how to engineer those prompts so that you, know, you can work with students. On it. So I don't know that there's any particular discipline where it might be more appropriate than others. I think it really is, again, a tool that you can adapt to your purposes for the particular discipline. Yeah, every discipline is different, so I think the applicability is going to be different. Every faculty member teaches a different way, so you know I think we have to understand that it's going to look different for everyone. You know I think that um, there are some, in some ways, chat uh, AI is more advanced in some fields. Mm -hmm. Just very simply put, just by by the nature of what it is, and it's going to be used more in industry mm -hmm. in some fields. You know, and I think for some some areas that may that may actually be a little frightening for us because we don't know the direction that it's headed in but I think it's also really exciting to watch this grow and develop and and to see how what this really will do for our society as a whole mm -hmm. yeah I, I guess my first inclination was I would think that the humanities perhaps the social science mm -hmm. more than perhaps math I don't know um, yeah, I I, my understanding is I think there are some limitations on what it can do in terms of notation mm -hmm. for, you yes. know, like mathematical notation, but it's getting increasingly more powerful. So I think it, it varies quite a bit. You know, I, so my understanding is that in areas like computer science and engineering, mm -hmm. it can do quite a bit already. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and as it continues to learn and grow and improve, yeah. who knows where we'll head. Right. Right. So we have this faculty member who's 80 years old. Mm -hmm. And, and not give up yet. And probably just says, you know, I'm just going to go back to blue books. You know what blue books are? Sure. Uh, That's what we used back in my day. Well, I was going to well, say, too. back uh -huh. in the day, I did, I, I think, I went to Wake Forest University. Um, I think there was only two multiple choice tests I ever had. I had mm -hmm. blue books and blue books. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be the safest form, I guess. It's a matter of degrees, but you may have some of the people who said, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Difficult faculty, and um, how do you anticipate that? Well, none of my faculty are difficult, Bob. <laughs> I'm just going to say that right now. They are wonderful people. Oh, my none word. None of them are difficult at all. Oh, at my all. gosh. <laughs> they're, they're great. But, you know, and I'm, I'm being sincere. I think they're, they're, yeah. we really have some fantastic faculty oh, at Virginia sure. Tech with the best interests of our students at heart. You know, and I think that there's a lot of value to doing things the old school way in some ways, in some way, shape, or form. You know, I also think that um, there are opportunities to offer faculty members support in different aspects of um, assessment. You know, when we do have a faculty member who might want to try something different but isn't quite sure how to go about that. And, you know, I think that there are real opportunities to um, provide faculty development in those areas. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think there's room for that that writing by hand, right? I don't think, it, it, just because we now have, yeah. the, you know, AI tools doesn't mean that we then throw away those kinds of ways exactly. of learning, right? I mean, now we have more modalities that we can draw from, and so that might be some more effective learning tool for some students than others. So having a variety of tools is always a good idea, and I think also just thinking about how, 
if we're, it, it, the important piece is how do we scaffold the learning? So it might be that sitting in class and writing by hand, getting some initial ideas down, whether that's in a blue book or just on a chunk of paper, piece of paper, you know, either way, helping students to kind of build up their confidence as they go towards a my, more mm -hmm. high stakes type of assignment, I think is always a good idea. Um, and there's just a lot of different ways to do that. And it could actually, it could begin with just a few ideas that are in chat GPT, but then go back and do it as an iterative process. You know, mm -hmm. the handwritten versus the using the AI tools. I mean, mm -hmm. just think about it as sort of this, this arsenal of, of or, or, you know, toolkit that you have for different ways of engaging and learning. Absolutely. So I think a great way to use AI would be to use it to help a student improve what they've written on, what they've written already, and then to compare the two, and then to criticize the piece generated by AI. I think there are real opportunities to use it to help the student to further their own academic skills to improve mm -hmm. for the next time. Yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are, again, kind of prompts that you can be um, using in, in AI that help with, for example, getting a student to again, ask them questions about the writing that they've done or perhaps the sample that they put into it. So getting the students to engage more critically with their own writing. So mm -hmm. it might ask them questions kind of in a, almost like in a tutoring mode. Mm -hmm. um, so teaching students how to do, do that could be really valuable. I was uh, reading where um, there's a certain amount of paranoia to the extent that um, before you turn your paper in, you would run it and make sure that it, it is okay that it would not be flagged as mm -hmm. cheating or something. I mean, there's some, some um, evidently software and stuff like that and I already have it in English, right, where they can sure. um, right. test that. Yeah, so Virginia Tech is a Turnitin school. We do use um, Turnitin, which is a software that you're referring to, to um, review papers, to um, flag potential problems. However, we really look at it as a tool for faculty to better assist their students with um, citing material as well as um, providing faculty and students with a resource. Um, with generative AI, with generative AI and, and kind of using that, you know, as, as a potential tool, I know that there's um, Turnitin ha has developed something where they're able to check, you know, at this point. My opinion is that it's not reliable. We're not at a place yet where we can rely on that as a sole form of identifying um, things that have been generated by, artif by generative artificial intelligence. You know, there are other telling ways for faculty to do that. Many of my faculty will look at the spacing that students turn in because they'll just copy and paste. I've had several who will, who, uh, will actually <laughs> turn in the, the text that they've copied and pasted that includes a statement that says generated by chat GPT. <laughs> um, you know, so we've got that, you know, in addition to that, they'll look at, they'll look at the language. You know, chat, generative artificial intelligence, right, right now is not able to reflect in the same way that a per in the, the same way that a person is so even though it's using um, common speech common tone common language that it's learned it doesn't sound like other writing that the student has done it, it's not even close you know so there are other ways to go about looking at something as a problem rather than using a using um, one of the chat one of the many checkers that's been generated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, the key is for it not to be too much of a burden, per se, in terms mm -hmm. of the faculty. Um, I know there were some who just simply said, you know, it was so prevalent, I can't be the guard of everything. Yeah. And therefore, basically saying, I just, if they're going to do it, if they're going to cheat, they're going to cheat. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere in between, it was always trying to find that, that balance. Uh, recently, um, and we have uh, three minutes or so remaining, um, recently, the governor has set out mm -hmm. some Mm -hmm. uh, executive outlines and guidelines uh, for considerations and it's interesting because in that they're going to have Chev, State Council of Higher Education for public institutions, mm -hmm. to try to work with institutions to come up with some general principles mm -hmm. uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. Want higher education to have two goals. Mm -hmm. Promote guidelines for use of AI tools which impact uh, learning and prohibit cheating mm -hmm. and the other was much more affirmative of saying that let research participate in uh, artificial mm -hmm. intelligent research and funding and developing experience because it's going to be part of the workforce. And so I, clearly there's a very important role mm -hmm. for higher ed 
addressing in terms of uh, AI across mm -hmm. the board. Mm -hmm. uh, in a couple of minutes, a minute and a half or so we have running, what are your final thoughts that you would share on this? this snapshot where we are right now? Well, I, I think the upshot for me is we have a really powerful tool. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be using it. We need to be curious about it. Um, we need to be thinking about best uses of it mm -hmm. at the same time that we maintain our own humanity and our own mm -hmm. autonomy. Mm -hmm. And please. I love how you just put that. Maintain our own humanity and our own autonomy. You know, we need to make sure that we are not relying on artificial intelligence to do things for us, that we are fully capable as a society and as humans that we're able to move forward. Um, kind of my bigger overarching thought that I share with my faculty and then the people that I work with on a regular basis, don't be scared. Mm -hmm. Don't be scared of advancement. It's going to happen with or without us. So we, we need to roll along with it the best way we possibly can. And would you say that we're in the phase one of this? Yes. Oh, yes. We are early on. Very, Very much early. early on. Yeah. Indeed. Well, believe it or not, that's all the time we have. I certainly want to thank my guests for being with us. And as always, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.